I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of our committee. As you know, we are able to offer a series of four free lectures each year, wholly supported by the Isaac, Harry, Isaac Harris Carey Fund, which was set up by the Carey Sisters in 1921. You see, we're approaching our centenary to help educate the townspeople of Lexington. They also gave our town this beautiful hall for these lectures and other events, including town meeting. Don't forget that we have one more terrific uh, event to go this year, the panel on immigration entitled Coming to America, Then and Now, with Marjan Kamali and many others. That's on Wednesday, May 9th. Um, I say this because, as you all know, uh, we had two cancellations because of snow, and this was one, not cancellations, postponements. This was a snow delay, and it will be on Wednesday, May 9th. Next year, among our new speakers, we'll bring back Irene Pepperberg, about whom many of you have asked, the researcher on parrots and learning. Many of you have asked about this after her talk was also postponed by snow. She told us also that she can't bring live parrots because it stresses them too much, but she will have videos of them in action. Um, also, um, let me point out the exits here. That's for fire reasons. There are two exits at the back here and two on the sides and also exits, similar, similar exits uh, at the balcony. Tonight, we're delighted to welcome Professor Stephen Greenblatt, the Kogan University Professor of the Humanities at Harvard. He has received numerous honors and is the author of many books, many, many books. His newest, The Rise and Fall of Adam and Eve, is just out and will be available for signing and sale in the lobby after the lecture. Two other books will also be available, uh, Will in the World, How Shakespeare, How, How Shakespeare Became Shakespeare, the work most closely related to tonight's subject, and The Swerve, How the World Became Modern. Now, I can't resist telling you about my own first encounter with Professor Greenblatt, and I'm choosing my words carefully here. Sometime in the mid-1980s, I was a young professor of literature at MIT. You probably don't remember this. I'm sure you, you don't remember me, but you may remember things. A uh, youngish professor of literature at MIT, and with a historian, ran a joint history and literature seminar for faculty. When we invited, uh, Stephen Greenblatt, he was uh, to our seminar to talk. He was already famous among academics, first as a Renaissance scholar, and also because he was a founder of an approach he called the New Historicism, which advocated, I hope you forgive me for this one line summary, I hope it's all right, uh, which advocated a kind of feedback loop between all sorts of written texts, not just literature, and the culture that produced them using the techniques of literary analysis, among other tools. And this has become an accepted way of approaching the humanities ever since. That day, he gave a spellbinding talk on the first encounter between Columbus and the Arawak people on the island of Hispaniola. He drew on Columbus's original records and in wondrous fashion opened my eyes to a completely new view of the foundation of the so-called new world in a fatal misunderstanding about language. This talk, I surmise, became part of one of his earlier books, Marvelous Possessions, The Wonder of the New World. And that's why I chose the first encounter and wonder and all that, because his talk was a wonder too. I can tell you that you're in for a treat tonight. Again, Professor Greenblatt will be available after the talk to sign books. And now I'm delighted to introduce him to you. much uh, to uh, Rita Goldberg for the wonderful, generous introduction and for the elegant uh, summary of, of uh, the new historicism. Uh, thank you all for uh, being here. Uh, every morning, uh, after I've glanced at the headlines to reassure myself that the world has not yet come to an end, uh, I invariably uh, turn to the obituaries. Uh, I tell myself that I have a professional interest in narrative, uh, and it's true that obituaries are a treasure trove uh, of fascinating short stories. But uh, as Ross Chast's cartoon uh, slyly reveals, uh, my interest is rather more personal. Uh, 
and it's not <laughs> death alone. Um, perhaps it's not really death most of all uh, that haunts me as I uh, approach it. Uh, rather, it's the accumulation of losses before uh, that end. I'm going to talk uh, tonight about losses and about endings. That Inevitably, this is not going to be a tremendously upbeat uh, evening. Uh, and specifically, I'm going to talk about King Lear, uh, Shakespeare's great play about endings. But you know, of course, that gravestones uh, always note the beginning uh, as well as the ends uh, of lives. Uh, I want to begin in that spirit uh, at or at least very near the beginning, not in this case, so that slide suggests my beginning and my parents' lives, but rather uh, this. When my Lord Adam <clears throat> and my Lady Eve were cast out of paradise, they made a tabernacle uh, wherein to be and to dwell and they were there seven days and cried and mourned and were in great sorrow and very great sadness. After those days had passed, they had a great yearning to eat. They were starving. So begins uh, the old French Andreas manuscript, which is one of the many apocryphal lives of Adam and Eve that circulated uh, throughout late antiquity and the Middle Ages. And uh, I can't get, even though I've, usually when I finish publishing, I finish the project and publish it, I get it out of my mind. I can't get Adam and Eve completely out of my mind, as you'll see in a minute. Together with a massive body of commentary, both rabbinical and patristic, uh, texts like, the, like this one, which is very, very early, dates from uh, the early centuries of the Common Era, uh, had uh, indicate that by already by uh, the certainly by the first and second centuries of the common era and probably earlier, the gnomic verses of the book of Genesis had come to seem at once tantalizing and parsimonious, a blend of ethical conundrums and baffling silences. Uh, as a, a certain point, I finally, after working for years on the Adam and Eve story, I realized that the Adam and Eve story in Genesis was written by Franz Kafka. Uh, <laughs> The various apocryphal accounts, such as this one, answered the need for a narrative that would register both the emotional state of Adam and Eve, principally misogynistic reproach and penitential sorrow, and also, as here, their bodily experiences. Thus, the passage at which you've just glanced imagines the moment at which the fallen pair feel for the first time desperate hunger and then realize just after this passage, to, the, to their dismay, that their hunger can now be assuaged only with the same food that animals eat. For the first time, then, humans are forced to grasp uh, that they are themselves animals. In Genesis, vast stretches of Adam's life history <clears throat> are summed up in a very few words. He lived 930 years, then he died. <laughs> he died is for these apocryphal texts, these writers who follow in the wake and try to figure out what the story actually means, that's a phrase that demands narrative elaboration. Uh, in the manuscript at which we've just glanced, Adam summons his children and tells them that he's ill. I have a great pain in my heart, he says. But they cannot even understand what he means by the words pain or sickness. Uh, they let alone recognize the symptoms of a heart attack. Grasping that death is imminent, Adam takes the occasion once again to blame his wife. <laughs> and then Adam looked at Eve and said, fair lady, it was because of what you did. <laughs> he knows that the fate that he is now suffering will be visited upon all his descendants, and he's eager that the source of their misery will be made clear to uh, what he calls our lineage. And for this reason, fair lady, Adam instructs his wife, tell your sons what you did. Eve, Eve's turn to die uh, comes six days after Adam's death in these apocryphal stories. As if in fulfillment of Adam's injunction, she calls Seth and her other children together, but she subtly modifies the message that her husband has told in 
uh, told her to give. It was, she tells them, because of what both she and Adam did, that they and their offspring forever are condemned to die. She then makes a crucial provision, the provision in effect of a cultural transmission that depends not only on speech but also on a more durable inscription. I order you to make tablets of stone and of clay and on the tablets you'll write the lives of your father and mother and all you have seen and heard. You'll write the lives of your father and mother. The Genesis text had imagined the origin of life. The, these early apocryphal texts, apocryphal, they didn't ever become part of the uh, scripture, but they circulated enormously widely in the ancient world. The apocryphal text narrating the death of Eve imagines the origin of life stories, as if it were only through death, the death that Eve has just witnessed in Adam and the death that she is about to experience in her own body, it's only through death that a human being can actually have a story and provide for that story to, to be durably recorded, preserved, uh, and remembered. Not everything is written in scripture about how the ages ran their course after the first establishment of things, uh, St. Augustine. So we in our ignorance have to fill in by conjecture the gaps. What was the shape of the lives of Adam and Eve? What did they feel when they were expelled from paradise? How were they able to adjust to the transition from the inexhaustible plenty uh, of the garden to the harsher, the more competitive realm uh, beyond its boundaries? How did they ward off predators? What division of labor did they decide upon? How did they learn to raise their offspring? How did their relationship as husband and wife evolve over the course of their lives? Did they regard their fate in the same light? How did they experience the death that was not part of the original design uh, of the existence for which they were created? That original design conferred upon Adam and Eve almost none of the key elements of human life history, elements that these uh, texts grope to supply for them in accounting for their lives after the fall. To be sure, even in the sparseness of Genesis, uh, the first humans are not complete blanks, almost, but not complete. Already in their prelapsarian state, they effortlessly possess two key species traits, uh, which all of the early commentators note. First of all, they possess the gift of speech, and then they possess the gift of sociability. That is to say, God himself declares in chapter 2 of Genesis that it's not good for the human to be alone. Could have thought of that in the first place, but evidently he didn't. It, at first he had Adam, and then it occurred to him that that wasn't the case. The creator makes it clear that it's not mere general sociability that he has in mind, but rather uh, what uh, biologists call pair bonding. Therefore, does a man leave his father and mother and cling to his wife, and they become one flesh. Reference to father and mother must have been very mysterious to poor Adam. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this union is presumably linked to the earlier moment in chapter 1 where it's written that God created the human in his image. Male and female, he created them. And that he blessed them with the words, be fruitful and multiply. The lack of any specific instruction about how the first humans were to fulfill the injunction to multiply led many early commentators to speculate that God originally created a hermaphrodite, or envisaged some non-sexual form of reproduction, or at least intended a mode of intercourse radically different from anything that we know. All that's un unambiguously clear is that God planned that the beings he created in his image and likeness would eventually spread uh, beyond the boundaries of Eden and become the Earth's dominant species. Fill the Earth and conquer it, he declares, and hold sway over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the heavens and every beast that crawls upon the earth. Pair bonding, reproduction, and overall species success were part of the original divine design. But it was a design without the narrative arc of human history and possibly without sex as we now know it. 
The man without a navel, that's how the 17th century uh, intellectual Thomas Brown called Adam, the man without a navel never burst through the narrow birth canal in order to come wailing onto the shores of life. Like Eve, he never suckled from a mother's breast, never cut teeth, never was weaned. Neither he nor his wife passed through the extraordinarily prolonged period of dependency and slow development that's the hallmark of our species. With an abundance of food, there was for them no biological weighing of investments, no setting of reproduction against survival, no trade-offs, no old age, and no death. These omissions were not a primitive oversight. They were the point of the whole myth. The Genesis story were the precipitate of an immensely long process of sifting and condensing. They were the product of people who had had millennia to observe closely the lives of animals and of their fellow humans, and who understood rather better than we do the implacable logic of trade-offs. Genesis, as early readers understood, imagined what it would have been like to be recognizably human, but not to have human life histories. Adam and Eve, the rabbis taught, were both created at the age of 20. This means that Eve did not experience menarche. Adam did not experience the hardening of his muscles or the descent of his testicles. Neither she nor her mate knew the confusions of adolescence or the sexual awakening of puberty. They came into existence, as both the Jewish and Christian commentators remark, fully prepared for reproduction, but for a reproduction meant to be uneventful and undisturbing, at least in the dominant uh, Christian interpretation that was uh, given by uh, the great Augustine. Without the seductive stimulus of passion, with calmness of mind and no corrupting of the integrity of the body, the husband would lie upon the bosom of his wife. That there would have been no corrupting of the integrity of the body, that is to say, no breaking of the hymen, no blood, no compulsive urgency, uh, is for Augustine the consequence of the fact that the sexual organs which are now conspicuously a law unto themselves, uh, were before the fall entirely under the control of the rational will. If anyone doubts that such a thing were possible ever, Augustine wrote, he need only recall that we can move at will parts of our bodies that are composed of slack and soft nerves, he says, such as our tongues, or reflect on the fact that certain people at least can wiggle their ears, uh, or move their scalp, backwards and forwards, uh, or even, as he uh, records, break wind continuously at pleasure so as to produce the effect of singing. <laughs> he had evidently seen something that the French call a petoman uh, in, in Carthage. Adam knew that the subject he was addressing and the, the examples like this uh, would arouse smiles of embarrassment, especially insofar as they serve as models for what sex would have been like uh, in paradise. The embarrassment reflects the shame uh, with which sexual reproduction is now associated, but that shame is precisely the consequence of our expulsion from paradise and the consequent loss of control over sexuality. Who doesn't know, Augustine writes, what passes between husband and wife that children may be born? Is it not for this purpose that wives are married with such ceremony? And yet when this, is well, when this well understood act is gone about for the procreation of children, not even the children themselves, who may already have been born to them, are suffered to be witnesses. Not even the children themselves. Did Augustine then imagine that in paradise, children would have been permitted to watch their parents in the act of copulation? Yes, that's precisely what he imagined, since that act would have been unremarkable entirely without shame and without history. But this paradisal sexuality had uh, no history in a double sense. It was meant to be an entirely unnoteworthy act, and Augustine points out it never happened. Adam and Eve fell before they had the opportunity to engage in it. And all subsequent human experience of intercourse is haunted not solely by shame, 
but by the split between the mind and body, the split that was famously described in one of uh, his most celebrated passages by St. Paul. I see another law in my members fighting back against the law of my mind and taking me prisoner under the law of sin, which is in my members. Unhappy man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? Death was the consequence of the primal act of human disobedience. But so for Augustine with sexual intercourse as we now know it, the two knotted inextricably together in a complex paradoxical bond. On the one hand, reproduction made possible by intercourse enables the survival of our species and hence serves as a triumph over death. On the other hand, intercourse is the primary experience in life of what Paul calls the body of this death. The gap between the mind and the body, the existence of a separate law in the members, the awareness of a somatic compulsion that's independent of our conscious intention and control. This core post-lapsarian post sexual experience is for Augustine and Paul the ineradicable sign of a being destined not for, I should say flippantly, not for Viagra, uh, but for death. Uh, the, the experience that it's not completely in your control. And with this destiny, as the Andreas manuscript and others suggest, comes the impulse, both the compulsion and the possibility of telling your story, your life story. The possibility, in effect, of literature. Biology has long had at its center its own version of the idea of a separate law on the members. The drive to replicate and transmit genes does not at all depend upon the consciousness, belief, or intentions of the agent by which these genes are carried. That separate law is the mark of our existence uh, as animals. It denotes our participation in a vast process of natural selection, which few of us comprehend, and over which we have virtually no control. And there is, for evolutionary biologists, as there was for St. Augustine, an essential relationship between the way we reproduce and the fact of our mortality. As uh, the biologist, Yale biologist Stephen Stearns uh, writes, the cost of specialization into germline and soma is death. That is, all organisms that reproduce sexually are subject to aging and mortality. If biologists do not posit a time in the species life of humans in which we could have escaped the separate law of the members, they can and do set our form of reproduction against an existing alternative when there is no distinction, uh, Stern writes, uh, when there is no distinction between germline and soma, as in all organisms that reproduce asexually by simple and equal division, there should be no aging. Some clones of grass are estimated to be 15,000 years old. But this life without aging, without death, and hence without history, is not compatible with any form of sexual reproduction. In biology, as in theology, sexuality implies both mortality and life history. What's the shape of a life? A life, that is, that has a history. For the biologist, the answer requires a vast effort of data collection from which the researchers surface occasionally uh, to compare the different temporal patterns of the trees, the wasps, the fish, the humans, and other creatures whose survival and reproductive strategies they're attempting to track. In charting the peculiarities of human life history, the favorite comparison group uh, of humans, of course, uh, are not so much the wasps and the fish, uh, but our cousins, the other primates. By setting statistics drawn from our evolutionary next of kin, uh, against statistics drawn from extant populations of human hunter-gatherers, biologists have identified what they take to be certain key features of our own lineage. Those features throw into sharp release, uh, into relief, sorry, 
the Edenic myth of human life without human history. That is to say, uh, they call attention to everything that the Genesis myth dreamed of erasing. And they call attention as well to the problem around which Shakespeare constructed one of his greatest tragedies. All the mammals of the order to which we belong, the order of the great apes that emerged some five to seven million years ago, are characterized by single births as opposed to litters. Every once in a while, uh, a human has a small litter, but very infrequently. And to the intense, prolonged paternal care that such births enable. Humans have carried this prolongation of offspring dependency to an extreme, even in relation to our closest primate kin. Though human infants are weaned much earlier than other primates, the average age of weaning for an orangutan is seven years, a chimpanzee four and a half years, and a human is uh, weaned uh, under three years old, it takes us much longer to gain the size and learn the skills that we would need to forage competently for ourselves. That is to say, we can't, after weaning our young, just let them fend for themselves. Chimpanzees get their molars well before weaning, thereby preparing them to masticate solid food. Our molars do not erupt until we're over six years old, so that long after weaning, we depend on food being specially prepared for us by adult caregivers. Such extravagantly slow and very costly dependence seems linked to the development of our brains, uh, our acquisition of language, and our painstaking mastery of complex cultural codes, all of which require considerable time and a massive extended parental investment of care. Compared to other primates, humans do not begin to reproduce until very late. The late commencement of reproduction is, off, is offset uh, by one of the prime consequences of early weaning. Humans have relatively brief interbirth intervals. The, an orangutan averages a little over eight years between offspring, chimpanzee almost five and a half years, but the human average among hunter-gatherers is 3.69 years. The use of wet nurses in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, and as many of you know, uh, upper-class women routinely used uh, wet nurses, that enabled those women to diminish the intervals still further. John Donne's wife, Anne, for example, was pregnant 12 times in 15 years. And that's by no means rare uh, in, for upper-class women in uh, that period. If we recall that human infants are very slow to develop nutritional independence, these births in quick succession mean they partly mean that human infants died at a tremendous rate, of course, but they also mean when they survive that human mothers are able, as one biologist puts it, to stack their offspring. And this stacking, in turn, means that human survival draws upon the particularly intense gregariousness of our species. Being gregarious means, among other things, being organized in groups that feed, shelter, and instruct swarms of extremely dependent young. Mothers bear the brunt of the parental investment in offspring, but human males differ from the males in other great ape species by routinely, if not altogether reliably, uh, helping to provide the food that's eaten by women and children. Human females differ from the females in other great ape species by routinely, if not altogether reliably, living for years after menopause. On average, Human males, too, greatly outlive their knuckle-walking cousins and outlive, for that matter, just about every other uh, animal except for Indian elephants and Galapagos tortoises. There must be, the evolutionary model suggests, some reason for natural selection to have favored this remarkable longevity. One current theory, at least for postmenopausal survival, is that experienced females are thereby available to provide help to mothers coping with multiple offspring. No comparable theory has been proposed to explain the longevity of human males. <laughs> Their hunting and fighting skills certainly do not continue without abatement, but unlike women, their reproductive potential declines only slowly, 
and the natural conditions, a variety of accidents presumably contrived to keep the number of extremely old males to a minimum. The key point, and the reason that human postmenopausal longevity needs any explanation at all, is that there is a clear evolutionary link between the end of reproduction and the onset of old age, that is a senescence. From an evolutionary perspective, old age cannot be explained by the simple wearing out of parts, since for a considerable length of time, our bodies are able to rejuvenate themselves, repair damage, and replace cells. In a remarkably influential scientific paper published uh, about a half century ago, the biologist George C. Williams argued that natural selection may be said to be based, may be said to be biased in favor of youth over old age whenever a conflict of interest arises. This bias means that genes that have beneficial effects early in life will be selected in natural selection, even though those same genes have cumulative bad effects later on. As with any uh, biological theory, this has been uh, nuanced and complicated, but has had a remarkable, this theory has had a remarkable long life uh, and hasn't by any means been uh, completely abandoned as a way of explaining, for example, uh, how cancer, uh, one of the ways in which cancer works. The principle, which Williams called antagonistic pleitropy, uh, a, a very uh, fancy term indeed, uh, is part of the larger system of trade-offs that govern the whole life process. The fact that there's a price to pay for the genes that are good for you when you're young, for example, is irrelevant. From an evolutionary perspective, all that matters is to enhance the likelihood of survival through the reproductive period, a period that extends for humans beyond the birth of the youngest child, and indeed beyond the weaning of the youngest child, to the moment when that youngest child is self-sufficient. After that moment, the post-reproductive individual who has transmitted the genes and help the offspring achieve self-sufficiency has no further purpose and can be, from a biological point of view, discarded. In the memorable words uh, of King Lear, age is unnecessary. He doesn't mean that it's not necessary to grow old, but that old people aren't necessary. Those words aren't a cool assessment of biological truth. They're meant to be an absurdity in Shakespeare's play. The parodic expression of an abasement, a degradation that the king regards as inconceivable. His daughter Regan has proposed that he return uh, to his elder daughter Goneril, from whose house he stormed away, and to admit that he's been at fault and Lear explodes. Ask her forgiveness. Do you but mark how this becomes the house? Dear daughter, I confess that I'm old. Age is unnecessary. As an attempt to awaken Regan to the preposterousness of her suggestion, Lear's little rehearsal of abject humiliation is a failure. Good sir, no more, uh, she says coolly responding as if to a child's tantrum, these are unsightly tricks. But as so often in this play, the king's wild utterance, age is unnecessary, speaks some larger truth. Lear's responding not only to Regan's idea that he should apologize to Goneril, but also to her attempt to make him understand precisely where he stands. She wants her father to grasp the reality of his situation both in relation to the particular post-retirement arrangement that called for him. You remember, to, he was, he, if you remember the play, he had uh, made an arrangement after he gave away everything to sojourn, as he puts it, for a fixed period of time with each daughter in succession. Uh, so he'd spend a little time with the oldest one, then with the middle one, he, uh, not with the youngest one, whom he's disinherited. Uh, and then also in relation to the larger, still more inflexible arrangement of nature itself. Oh, sir, you are old, she's told him. 
Oh, sir, you are old. Five simple syllables which the poet Coleridge professed to find uh, excessively, excessive in their horror. On the face of things, it doesn't look so horrible to say, oh, sir, you're old. Uh, why should it be monstrous to express this simple, honest truth? Or to go on, as Regan does, to spell out exactly what she means. Oh, sir, you're old. Nature in you stands on the very verge of her confine. You should be ruled and led by some discretion that discerns your state better than you yourself. Later in the play, Regan will behave in a way that amply justifies Coleridge's horror. But why should her words at this point be so disturbing, particularly since they seem only to reinforce what her father himself has publicly acknowledged at the beginning of the play? This is a play that begins with, his, with the old man saying he no longer wants to be, feels capable, wants to be king, and he wants to retire uh, and turn over everything to his uh, children, just retain the name uh, of King. That's how it begins uh, in a scene that uh, brings together, as befits an absolute monarchy, uh, the story of a state and the story of a life. Give me the map there. Know that we've divided in three our kingdom, and tis our fast intent to shake all cares and business from our age, conferring them on younger strengths, while we unburdened crawl toward death. Lear's not dying uh, at that point. He's not ill. He does not even show signs of any uh, conspicuous weakening of vigor. Later in the play, his daughter Regan will exclaim in exasperation, I pray you, Father, being weak seems so. But he has reached, or believes he's reached, the point at which the principal work of his existence has come to an end. The absence in the play uh, of any Mrs. Lear, only confirms what we can presumably see from looking at him and what he himself recognizes. He's beyond any productive or reproductive life, and he wishes to free himself from the burdens he's borne in fathering and in caring for his children and in ruling his kingdom. He cannot know exactly when, but at some point, not in an unimaginably distant future, but in a foreseeable time, his body will fail him. He will, as his image of crawling toward death suggests, he will no longer be able to stand up on his own two legs. Something in him will sicken. His heart will stop beating, perhaps, or another organ in his body will fail him, or he'll be unable to fight off some opportunistic illness feeding on his own flesh. That's the natural order of things, and it cannot be averted. Lear's concern you will note, uh, is not with what awaits him beyond death. There is no imagined afterlife in his world. There's very little imagined afterlife in general in Shakespeare, but certainly in King Lear. No ghosts who haunt the living, no Elysian fields, no Tartarus. His death will be the end of him, but he wants to preside over the close of his own life history thereby making his destiny his choice. He chooses to do so at the symbolically charged moment at which his oldest children being already mated, that's to say Goneril and Regan both have husbands, his youngest child has reached what his culture recognizes as the point of self-sufficiency. And that's the moment at which he chooses to retire, very totally familiar to us, except if you're a professor at Harvard, uh, but, uh, but re actually relatively unfamiliar in Shakespeare's world, a planned retirement moment. Uh, and he noticed, he points out that the princes France and Burgundy, great rivals in our youngest daughter's love, long in our court have made their amorous sojourn and here to be answered. This is the moment at which Cordelia will get her husband, the third child will be married off, the third daughter, and the, as it were, the reproductive uh, plan of his family will be finished. For biologists, the self-sufficiency of the youngest child is, as we saw, the moment that defines the end of any living organism's extended reproductive period. And that's why there's a special appropriateness uh, 
to Lear's intention to distribute everything he possesses to his offspring at this moment. Why should he hold anything back? His life's labor is finished, as he recognizes, almost in spite of himself, age is unnecessary. But as so often in Shakespeare, the play opens with a conclusion. Here, the definitive biological resolution of a life history that then completely unravels. That's, Shakespeare loved that trick, the beginning of plays, that the moment you begin the play at the moment that things fall apart. Lear decides, apparently impulsively, to stage a contest. Tell me, my daughters, since now we will divest us both of rule, interest of territory, cares of state, which of you, shall we say, doth love us most? That we our largest bounty may extend where nature doth with merit challenge. He wants, he says, not simply to hear his daughter's gratifying declarations of love, but to weigh them one against the other and to decide on that basis which should receive the largest share of his resources. His impulse to do so seems entirely irrational since we've already learned in the opening moments of the play that the precise terms of the distribution have been fully disclosed and carefully scrutinized. The play opens uh, the very act one, scene one, uh, with a character saying to the other, in the division of the kingdom, it appears not which of the dukes he values most, for equalities are so weighed that curiosity in neither can make choice of either's moiety. That's putting it in a characteristically sh annoying Shakespearean complexity. But the, the two of the shares have been exactly measured and they're exactly the same. The two shares are intended for Goneril and Regan and their husbands, and the third share will go to Cordelia and whomever succeeds in obtaining her hand in marriage. And we, even I can do the simple math that says if the two shares, two of the three shares have been perfectly scrutinized, it means the third share is also known to everyone. Though everyone understands that Cordelia is Lear's favorite, it's not clear that her intended share is any larger. <clears throat> Indeed, there's an unspoken presumption that Lear has chosen to prevent future strife, as he puts it, <clears throat> by an equitable distribution. In any case, it's all been settled. What then accounts for his impulse to stage the love test? Which of you, shall we say, doth love us the most? <clears throat> Lear wishes to experience for one last time what all parents with more than one dependent child routinely encounter, an intense competitive claim on their investment. As he makes clear, <clears throat> the issue is a struggle for a larger share <clears throat> of whatever he has to bestow. And the test will be which of his offspring make, makes the most convincing display of the signs that he finds most compelling. These signs are not, as with <clears throat> newborns, cries of distress, cries that say at once, I need food to survive, and I am strong and healthy, and thus worth significant parental investment. Just hear how loud I can be. <laughs> Rather, in the case of Lear, the, ling the linguistic equivalent of the gratifying signaling that infants learn long before they acquire language. The smiles, the upraised arms, the looks of adoration. It's perhaps understandable enough that Lear craves this particular gratification as he makes his final grand gift. The sweet signs, those uh, signs in the play uh, that are the equivalent of what, if you, any of you have had children know, you get it, one of the huge boards that you get as a parent of small children. Uh, I love you more than words can wield the matter. These are among humanity's deepest pleasures. We adults are designed by nature to melt when we encounter them. And we quickly learn to solicit them and to long for them like a drug. Their diminishment, at first gradual, and then during adolescence, often precipitous, uh, is a form of painful reverse weaning. A weaning that can easily produce parental anxiety, melancholy, and rage. But there's another reason, apart from pleasure, for anyone in Lear's position to extract declarations of love from his children. The bond between parents and their dependent offspring makes complete sense 
from a biological perspective. It is, as it were, part of what St. Paul calls the law of the members. But the bond between offspring, once they're self-sufficient, and their parents is less obviously compelling. It doesn't take an evolutionary biologist to observe the decisive change in the relationship from the moment that children have themselves reached reproductive capacity. Therefore, does a man leave his father and mother and cling to his wife, and they become one flesh. Humans may have some natural, that is to say, they may have some genetic predisposition to, to aid their aging parents. They certainly give evidence of a psychological inclination to do so, uh, at least most humans, an inclination reinforced by a wide range of cultural injunctions. In Proverbs, sermons, stories, pictures, plays, rituals of respect and the like, Renaissance culture endlessly reiterated and reinforced the obligation of children to parents. But the pervasiveness of the message in this period and the recurrent invocation of a metaphysical support for the rights of the old, God loves old people, expects you to take care of them and so forth and so on, did not in fact preclude parental anxiety. On the contrary, the ceaseless repetition seems an expression of unappeased and surprisingly widespread insecurity. Maybe it shouldn't be so surprising, given the fact that there is no social security, uh, no safety net in this Shakespeare's world whatsoever. That insecurity fed on a queasy sense that there was no clear natural reason why offspring should invest in their parents once their parents' investment in them had been exhausted. High mortality rates from plague and other diseases, along with war, recurrent famine, endemic violence and the like, may have kept the full force of the riddle at bay. A great many parents in Renaissance Europe did not get to experience old age. In his essay on age, uh, the great Montaigne writes that we treat death caused by a decay of powers brought about by extreme old age as if it were the natural norm, as if we should expect to die of old age, uh, that that should be our ordinary fate by right. But the assumption, Montaigne writes, is counter to virtually everything we observe if we just look around in the world, as if it were contrary to nature, he says, to see a man break his neck by a fall, be drowned in a shipwreck, be snatched away by plague or a pleurisy. The truth is, that what we, what we regard as the natural way to die is in fact, in Montaigne's view, prodigiously rare. Death of old age, he says, is a rare, singular, and extraordinary death. And hence, it's actually less natural than the others. Uh, it's indeed, he says, the born beyond which we shall not go and which the law of nature is prescribed as not to be passed, but it's a very rare privilege of hers to make us last that long. It's an exemption which she grants by special favor to a single person in the space of two or three centuries. Well, he's exaggerating a little bit. Uh, looking far back in time as well as around him, Montaigne grasped that the innumerable supposedly accidental deaths or tragic deaths from disease too early, too young, were in fact part of a general natural reduction of the population. We were meant, as it were, to be consumed early, not to linger into senescence. From the perspective of actual experience, death by old age is weird and unnatural, he thought. Senescence poses a problem, it's a disturbance. That disturbance is felt not only in the aging, who may or may not realize the gradual diminution of their powers, including their reason. It's felt also and more intensely in the young. For though love of their offspring is imprinted in parents by nature, Montaigne thinks, uh, as he put it in his essay of the affection of parents, of fathers or parents for their children, a reciprocal affection of grown children for their parents is much less part of the natural design. It's not necessarily imprinted in children. Uh, and because nature seems to have recommended instinctual parental love, he writes, with a view to extending and advancing the successive parts of this machine of hers, 
an extremely unsentimental view of what nature is, rather like Richard Dawkins more than not. Uh, it's no wonder at all if turning backward, the affection of children for their fathers is not so great. Montaigne characteristically refuses to register this lack of reciprocity as a tragedy or a sign of human depravity. Nature's goal has nothing to do with sentiment. It has to do with the advancement of a machine. The love of parents for their children serves a natural design, which is expansive, forward-moving, and indifferent to the emotional life of the begetters, except insofar as that emotional life greases the machine. The reciprocal love of children for their aging parents serves, as far as Montaigne can tell, no comparable natural purpose. Now, Shakespeare had certainly read the two essays I've just shown you on the screen. He had read of aging, and he had read of the affection of fathers for their children. I could show you, if I had time, which I don't, I could show you their fingerprints uh, uh, all over King Lear. But the play is far more sy sympathetic than the essays to the gnawing fears of the aging and to the half-conscious understanding that the gratitude they expect from their children may have little or no basis in nature. Small wonder that Lear, who's at the point of exhaustion and is a hedge against the bleak future, should engage in a final ritual solicitation of love. The solicitation can draw upon a phenomenon that has been observed in many species, including our own, what the biologist Robert Trivers describes as a general tendency for the demand for parental investment child's demand for parental investment to be at its height, somewhat surprisingly, when the offspring are very close to self-sufficiency. Uh, Trivers wrote this actually without reference to, I think, to our culture's most striking version of this principle, that the demand for parental investment is at its height when offspring are very close to self-sufficiency, and that's called tuition, room, and board. <laughs> offspring Trivers observes, have generally learned at this point tactics for inducing such investment beyond any pressing material need, often against the parents' own wishes and in fierce competition with siblings who may be similarly jostling for whatever they can get. We get a glimpse of this competition in the flattery arms race between Goneril and Regan. Goneril's a love that makes breath poor and speech unable, counted by Regan's I find she names my very deed of love, only she comes too short. Rivalry is built into family life, as Shakespeare depicts it here, and throughout his work. If it does not inevitably turn murderous, as it does in this play and actually in several other plays of Shakespeare's, it's at least always potentially so. Lear is ostensibly staging the contest so that he can distribute his bounty to whichever daughter most deserves it in his view, but his motivating fear is already close to the surface and shows itself in those words to Regan, age is unnecessary. <clears throat> that outburst is followed immediately by what he thinks it implies for elderly parents. On my knees, I beg that you'll vouchsafe me raiment, bed, and food. The infant-parent relationship has been reversed, and it's the parent now who must cry, plead, and cajole for whatever it takes to survive. The problem is that it's not at all clear that children have the natural instinct that routinely leads parents to engage in costly trade-offs on behalf of their offspring. Hence Lear's demand for an extravagant display of love, and hence, too, his catastrophic misreading of his youngest daughter, Cordelia's, response to this demand, I love your majesty according to my bond, no more, no less. What does her bond amount to? We know, and the tragedy makes amply clear, that Cordelia's altruistic love for her father is incalculably deeper uh, than her sister's hollow protestations. But that incalculability is precisely the point. Though Lear extorts professions of adulation, though he rages against filial ingratitude, and though he cries out to the heavens to protect old men, he never discovers, and the play never establishes, whether there is any natural basis for the love that he is demanding of his children. Montaigne, for his part, is deeply unsympathetic to parental resentment of the supposed ingratitude and indifference 
of their grown children. Indeed, Montaigne writes, it seems that the jealousy we feel at seeing them appear in the world and enjoy it when we're about to leave it makes us more stingy and tight with them. It vexes us that they're treading on our heels as if to solicit us to leave. And since in the nature of things, they cannot in truth either be or live except at the expense of our being in life, we shouldn't have meddled with being fathers. As Montaigne develops this idea of the natural order of things, parental resources inevitably and properly depleted by the existence of children, he gives powerful voice to the resentment of the young. It's an injustice that an old, broken, half-dead father should enjoy alone in the corner of his hearth possessions that would suffice for the advancement and maintenance of many children and let them, meanwhile, for lack of means, lose their best years. The solution, Montaigne thought, was for the old to give away most of their possessions to their children. They should retain enough for themselves to live reasonably comfortably and should simply reserve the right to reclaim their possessions if the children turn out to behave badly. Shakespeare seems to have regarded these notions as exceptionally naive. In King Lear, the aged father does not cling to his possessions. As if he had taken Montaigne's advice to heart, he gives them all away, retaining only the right to reside with his retinue at his daughter's homes. But his gift affords him neither protection nor gratitude. I gave you all, he says to Regan, who replies, and in good time, you gave it. As for taking anything back, the idea is a pathetic fantasy. Strength is on the side of the young. The old merely have empty threats. No, you unnatural hags. I will have such revenges on you both that the why will do such things. Um, such words are the expression of impotent rage. R a rage that, failing to achieve its object, swells up in Lear into a more general loathing of the generative process on which he had relied. First, there's the hideous cursing of his daughter's womb, a uh, horrible moment uh, in the play. And then when he grasps that both of his daughters, on whom he had counted, have no intention to give him what he expected and demanded, a more general curse on the molds and germans, as he calls it, that is to say, the soma and the germ, that are the biological basis for human reproduction, all reproduction. Crack nature's molds, all germans spill at once that make ungrateful man. Lear originally, initially calls his daughter's ungratitude unnatural. But as his general curse suggests, his curse on all of nature suggests, their selfishness and cruelty seems at least as much part of nature as Cordelia's altruism. Although Cordelia's truthfulness and later her willingness to risk her own life, to rescue her father, are obviously of inestimable moral value. Her willingness, the play doesn't resolve their place, this extraordinary willingness to give herself. It doesn't resolve their place in the scheme of nature. At the end, the crazed Lear holds a feather to Cordelia's lips and thinks he sees some movement. This feather stirs, she lives. If it be so, it is a chance which does redeem all sorrows that ever I've felt. If it be so, but it isn't so. Cordelia is dead as earth which would have, by the way, astonished Shakespeare's first audience because the story as they received it had Cordelia living at the end. So Shakespeare, at the very end of his play, pulls out an un unbelievable coup de théâtre and has Cordelia dead. Her altruism, like the decency of a nameless servant who attempts to stop the torture of the aged Gloucester, is obviously deeply admirable, but it's not rewarded by the nature that the play continually interrogates. The strongest claim to a direct allegiance with nature is made by the bastard, Edmund, the bastard in multiple senses of that term. For Edmund, what most matters is the energy he possesses in abundance, an energy he traces back to the vitality of his illegitimate conception. Why brand they us with base, with baseness, bastardy, base, base, who in the lusty stealth of nature take more composition and fierce quality than doth within a dull, stale, tired bed go to the creating a whole tribe of fops got between asleep and wake. What for Augustine had been the infallible sign of human depravity and fallenness, the lusty stealth of intercourse, is for Edmund the sign of vigor. 
Nothing in King Lear unequivocally falsifies this vitalism, which is set against both foppish weakness and the artificial constraints of social custom. Those constraints stigmatize illegitimate children, reducing parental investment in them regardless of their native fitness, and honor the elderly, protecting their authority and their material well-being, regardless of their diminished strength and utility. In terms Shakespeare clearly adopted from Montaigne, Edmund gives voice to his unwillingness to accept the suppression of the natural interests of the young. This policy and reverence of age makes the world bitter to the best of our times, keeps our fortunes from us till our oldness cannot relish them. I begin to find an idle and fond bondage in the oppression of aged tyranny, who sways not as it hath power, but as it is suffered, as it is permitted to do so. These are parasitical sentiments that Edmund is, fo is foisting off on his legitimate older brother in order to destroy him. But everything in Edmund's subsequent behavior suggests that he himself regards the reverence of age as intolerable. When he decides to betray his father to the murderousness of the murderous Earl of Cornwall, Edmund articulates what he takes to be the proper natural principle. The younger rises when the old doth fall. But if, with its closing spectacle of Cordelia's lifeless body, King Lear emphatically does not endorse the view that nature rewards altruism, neither does it endorse the adaptive value of ruthlessness. To be sure, ruthlessness has its virtues. Through fierce hunger, ambition, and cunning, Edmund rises from the status of social outcast to a position of enormous wealth and power and erotic appeal. He displaces his older brother and his father's love, accedes to his father's title, uh, leads the army that defeats the French invasion of the kingdom, and has the power of life and death over the captured Lear and Cordelia. Goneril and Regan feverishly compete with each other for his sexual favors. But the play sets harsh limits to the value of this life strategy as well. At the end, Edmund is dead, along with Goneril and Regan. None of them is left behind a successor. The story of their lives is definitively over. The ingratitude of his selfish daughters had seemed to Lear unnatural and incomprehensible. He says, it's not as if this mouth should tear this hand for feeding it. But though the parent and his offspring share the same blood, as Lear puts it, he learns to his horror that their bodies and their interests are not identical. Indeed, that they may be in mortal competition. Still baffled, he looks around, dreams of some scientific investigation that might give him an answer. Let them anatomize Regan, he says in his madness. See what breeds about her heart. But the play leaves the problem unresolved. Though the term nature is used again and again, though the trade-offs are constantly questioned, strategies tested, the consequences weighed, Shakespeare's tragedy cannot or will not settle the relationship between altruism and selfishness, or establish basic norms for the successful negotiation of the stages of life history. Unaccommodated man, says the mad Lear, contemplating the naked beggar, is no more but such a poor, bare, forked animal as thou art. But what kind of animal this is remains unclear. Getting old is a tragic burden. That much is clear. At the very end of the play, Edgar says in the last lines, we that are young shall never see so much nor live so long. So I've thought about these lines for many years. I never fully understood them, always taking them for some inarticulate, almost mute gesture toward the incomprehensibility of everything that's past. Perhaps they are such a gesture, but I think now more that they're a simple recognition of the fact that Lear's extreme old age in the world depicted in the play and in the world that Shakespeare and his audience inhabited is a very, very rare event. As Montaigne reminded his readers, natural death seems hardly to have been part of nature's plan. It's weird. This weirdness is the basis of Shakespeare's tragedy. He's interested precisely in the fact that senescence makes so little natural sense. No so little sense 
from the perspective of the young and even from the perspective of the old themselves. And he focuses his astonishing powers of attention as a playwright on the aspect of senescence that's least relevant to the biological process of life history. That is, to the consciousness of an aging figure fitfully aware that his mental as well as physical powers are waning and anxious about the support that he'll receive from his offspring as they're entering into their own reproductive lives. This consciousness has no claim on the attention of an evolutionary biologist. It is, like the non-reproductive bodies of the very old, a kind of meaningless leftover. You know, at uh, dinner tonight, before this lecture, when I was talking to the members, the very kind members of the Cary uh, Committee, we were talking about what the humanities brings to the table in a world in which there seems to be less commitment to them now uh, than before. And it's here that I would look. Uh, it's here in thinking about what doesn't so obviously count uh, in the computing of the trade-offs of natural history. The being of a leftover in the case of King Lear, uh, the world of the consciousness of he who understands that age is unnecessary. For Shakespeare and for literature, this leftover is the thing itself. Now, if you give me, I've over, I'm over my time, but give me one minute more, if you would, and I'll just have a quick coda um, from our friend Charles Darwin. Up to the age of 30, or beyond it, Darwin writes in the autobiography he wrote at the end of his life for his children, poetry of many kinds, uh, such as the works of Milton, Gray, Byron, Wordsworth, Coleridge, and Shelley gave me great pleasure. And even as a schoolboy, I took intense delight in Shakespeare, especially in history plays. But now for many years, he says, I cannot endure to read a line of poetry. I've tried lately to read Shakespeare and found it so intolerably dull that it nauseated me. <laughs> Darwin is not proud of his nausea and doesn't recommend it to his children. But he's honest enough to acknowledge it, and he struggles to understand how it came about. My mind, he writes, seems to have become a kind of machine for grinding general laws out of large collections of facts. But why this should have caused the atrophy of that part of the brain alone on which the higher tastes depend, I can't conceive. I have no solution to Darwin's riddle, but I think it's been possible to perceive in King Lear and more generally in Shakespeare, the sense, in their, in their sense of a, Shakespeare's sense of the shape of a life, at once an affinity with the problems that fascinate the evolutionary biologist and also a profound difference. In literature, life history is a platform for human experience. In biology, human experience is an epiphenomenon of life history. At best, part of a ruse selected by nature to facilitate the transmission of genes, at worst, an irrelevance. At the beginning of Lear, the old man recognizes that his life history has reached its end. Making the final and definitive parental investment, he's giving up everything. But what lies ahead is what most matters to Shakespeare. The love test, the desire to retain the name and all the addition to a king, the insistence on the retinue, the rage, the grief, the madness, and finally Lear's fantasy of a redemption that we know will never come. Thank you very much for your attention. I've kept you a long time, it's a, uh, so I apologize for that. I should have been uh, more short-winded, but I'm, I'm uh, very eager to respond to, or any, even, I don't have to respond, to hear uh, questions, uh, comments, uh, life history stories, uh, objections, or whatever. Uh, there are microphones here if you like.
Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Esther Hu. I've been a Lexman resident since 2003, but this is the first time I've made it to one of these talks. I'm just so happy. I have uh, small children, uh, a toddler actually, in fact, right now, so that could be forgiven. Uh, I'm, excuse me? You, they'll hear you better if you speak directly into the microphone. Oh, okay. Uh, I have, um, I teach at Boston University. I'm on the faculty there, and uh, I regularly teach Romeo and Juliet. And now as a parent, I find myself making editorial comments, such as, don't go marry the boy you just met last night without telling us. Okay. This time, I haven't read uh, King Lear in some time, and this time I was rereading it, didn't quite finish, in anticipation for your talk, your wonderful talk. And I have a comment to make, and perhaps you can respond to it, and it has to do with your beginning about appetites and need, and it comes with when... Uh, after Lear divides the, the pieces to the two daughters that re, who had responded appropriately, yes. he wanted the retinue of 100 knights. And so Goneril cuts it down to 50, furious, fuming, he leaves, goes to Regan. And then Regan cuts it down to 25. And then uh, there's this part where uh, Goneril then says, he will go back to Goneril because at least she's going to give him uh, 50. And then Goneril says, hear me, my lord, what need you five and 20, 10 or five, to follow in a house where twice so many have a command to tend you? Regan says, what need one? And Lear says, oh, reason not the need. Reason not the need. Our basest beggars are in the poorest thing superfluous. And so in coming about needs, talking about needs, there's the need to fulfill the human appetite, uh, love, uh, food, drink. There's the need for human dignity, dignity, the different kinds of needs in age in particular. Yes, yes. Could you comment more on that, the different kinds of needs? Of course, it is a, the moment that you, that you point to and beautifully uh, evoke is one of the, uh, one of the uh, great and painful moments uh, in which Lear's uh, in, in which Lear's dignity, his sense of identity, really is is stripped away from him. The first thing I would say is slightly perverse, maybe will seem uh, will seem perverse to you, which is that that if you have a um, uh, a slightly deranged, uh, irascible. Uh, uh, old man in your household to give him 50 armed uh, or 100 or whatever, 50 armed men uh, is uh, at his command might seem to you if you were his daughter rather unreasonable uh, as, a, uh, as a proposition. And it, 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 early in the play when this scene happens, there's reason to think uh, that uh, it, it might be as, as uh, the lo in fact, we subsequently learn the loathsome. Regan says to him, you know, you have, my servants will take care of you. You don't need this, this armed retinue around you. So I want to express a certain sympathy uh, for the daughters dealing with uh, the old uh, codger uh, at that point. And indeed, we could, we could, of course, hovering over everything I said tonight is the fact that we've changed our world. Now we, our, our, our world is full of people, I'm evidence of it, who live lives that would have seemed fantastically old uh, in Shakespeare's time. And as we get older and older, we, we're full of trade-offs and calculations about what we'll do for uh, people in, at this point. And those calculations include stripping them, in fact, of often of what looks like what they're claiming to be their dignity in the interest of what we think is both uh, their own good and, and our good. So it's not as if we have, I mean, it's easy to, to demonize Colonel Regan, and they are demons, in fact, in the play subsequently. Uh, but there's, the play is, is in touch with a deep problem, which is what to do when, when uh, the, uh, the, uh, the parent insists on the name and all addition to a position that he no longer holds in the world. Uh, and uh, it's easy, I think, to, all too easy to think it's a question of the evil of these wicked children who are, you know, at a certain point, so horrible that all sympathy disappears 
uh, for them. But the problem, the deep problem, is a problem, as it were, in our lives. It doesn't go away. And, and I say this as someone... I mean, it's painful, actually, for me to uh, think about. My, my mother uh, was in a nursing home at the end of her life. If I could run the, the film back, maybe I could imagine living in a bigger house, setting something up in which I took her into my house, and so forth and so on. But I didn't. She wanted to be in, I mean, it was her choice. She wanted to be in a nursing home. But I could see from the beginning it was a disaster. Or that is, if not a disaster, it protected her, but it stripped away her dignity, piece after piece of it. Uh, in, it was a perfectly nice nursing home, but it wasn't right for her. I mean, it didn't suit her being, but I didn't do anything. So am I Garnerl and Regan? No. But I take it, I mean, the, Shakespeare, is, Shakespeare is unbelievably clever, among many other things, at somehow sensing where there would be a long-term set of questions, one that wasn't just for his time and place, but would continue on and on and on. And my God, we've inherited this one. Uh, so uh, there's more to say, but I, there are more people standing, yeah. Um, I'm Oliver Hart, I'm a Lexington resident. So you talk about the difficulty of motivating children to invest in their parents, to uh, reciprocate for what's been done to them earlier. But a potential solution is um, to give them stuff when you die. Um, that is to say, when I, as I listened to you, I was wondering why Lear handed all this stuff over in advance. I mean, you wanted this love, love competition um, quite early. I mean, it might have been better to have the implicit contract that many parents, I suspect, uh, not me, of course, or my wife, but other people with their children, which is if you're nice to us, yes. you know, you'll get yes. your share of the inheritance. Yes. And if your brother or sister is nicer, well, you know, they might get a bit more. And uh, that can be quite an effective strategy, yes. it seems to that's me. True. That, that's true. Uh, that's spoken uh, w with the wisdom of an economist. Uh, and, and, uh, it, it, and of course, it's true, particularly true for the 19th century novel, which is, which is uh, the great realist novels of the 19th century are full of s the situations of this kind. What's happened in our world, as you know, is that, that uh, our life histories have, have the generational, as I briefly said, the, the parents' generations are living so long now in relation to their children that the children are well into the world and established in the world where the, the pattern of the 19th century novel, which was that you could expect your parents to die and the distribution of uh, the inheritance would take place when you were starting a family, buying a house, starting a career, that's no longer the case. Very, very often, uh, I, I, I certainly hope to do it to my children, uh, that children are way along in the world in what would have been regarded as old by uh, Shakespeare standards before uh, I give way. And that, as they say, one part of the solution that we've come up with is, is college tuitions for, for a massive uh, distribution of wealth earlier. I mean this actually half seriously as a way of, because it's a distribution of wealth that's done to set the child up toward the trajectory, the arrow of family fortunes, as it would have been done in the 19th century through uh, death and inheritance. But now, since that doesn't happen at the right moment, we have a different system to do it. But yes, of course, you're right that uh, why Lear does it, and Lear is understood to be uncannily old in the play in his 80s, uh, and he can't, can no longer function as king. So part of it is the, is the, peculiar crossing over of the family story and the state story. Uh, and the, the pre but, but of course, in Shakespeare's time, they thought that the family and the state had some deep uh, connection uh, to one another. What I think our solution, in terms of reciprocity, has partly to do with holding that over our children, but something else has happened in our world that certainly wouldn't have happened in Shakespeare's world, which is that we collectively, as parents, pay tremendous amount of attention to the, uh, to the very early years of our children. And we do a certain kind of psychological training, not, not me necessarily consciously or deliberately, to our children about taking care of their parents. So that, that which certainly wouldn't have been done in a world of wet nurses and indifferent fathers, uh, it's not an accident that Lear is about the relationship between a father and his 
uh, grown children, because that's the moment at which you started paying attention to your children. You didn't pay attention to them when they, in the same psychological way, when they were two years old, but we do. And that's, I think, part of a strategy to deal with the problem that you described. Yeah. Uh, Professor Greenblatt, about uh, four to six weeks ago, uh, there was an article in the New York Times uh, about a book that was about to come out, I think, um, that, uh, that had the thesis that uh, perhaps Shakespeare was familiar with uh, Sir George North, uh, who, yes. was a, who was a minor figure in yeah. one of the 16th century courts or something, and that although he, he didn't, they, they weren't arguing that, that he plagiarized anything, but that, that he might have, that this might have been one reason why this fellow from outside London seemed to be so familiar, you know, with, with many of the uh, uh, inner workings of the courts. And I was just wondering if you're familiar with that, and uh, would you recommend it, or do you have an opinion on I it? I am familiar with it. I read, I just fairly recently read the book that you're, to which you're referring, and I found it extremely interesting. I mean, the, the m most interesting connections are between it's, it, uh, the plays that Shakespeare wrote, and especially the first, the Henry VI uh, trilogy, and, the, and uh, the, this document, this very interesting manuscript. And it's true that there are you know, quite interesting, not simply, simply single verbal echoes, but, but sets of verbal echoes. So. Uh, my first impulse with all of these things is always extremely skeptical. Um, be, Shakespeare could get lots of what he needed from, from Hollinshed's Chronicles and lots of other published works that, have, uh, uh, that scholars have long known about. In this case, I thought it was genuinely interesting that, that uh, certain uh, Jack Cade in Henry VI Part uh, Two says that he's, he's uh, eating, been forced to eat uh, salads, he says, uh, meaning meaning eating the grass, and that that term is an odd term to use for this, and it turns out to be in the North text. So it's it's a small detail. I think it's actually slightly smaller than uh, as a find than it than it was represented in the New York Times. But that's because one is excited about anything that you can find about Shakespeare. So I was extremely happy that they found it. Uh, Andre Radulescu, Mano. Um, so I find it interesting that Shakespeare is interested in the subject of an old uh, man, um, an old king. Um, and obviously he picked different subjects and his plays have a catalog of human uh, characters. But um, my, my question is, how does he identify with this character? I mean, he was obviously not old. Um, sometimes I would imagine when you write a play, you think yourself in the feet of this character, but why would he want to even be in the feet of this old king that has to go through this? Question. And thank you. Shakespeare was only in his 40s when he wrote the play. He was certainly not a, a, uh, uh, a very old man. It is, the, it is the strange characteristic of Shakespeare. It's one of the things that ma makes him still uh, alive in the way that he is, that he seems to have been able to uh, peel out of himself, to take out of himself identifications where you would least expect them to come, with the with the uh, black slave Aaron the Moor uh, in Titus Andronicus, uh, with the um, half mad, violent, drunken Native American Caliban uh, in the Tempest. Uh, there's something uh, remarkable, or for that matter, in a world of of a kind of genial misogyny of which Shakespeare certainly part, in which Shakespeare participated, with a with a whole succession of very powerful independent women, uh, and I don't know where he got it, honestly. I mean, I thought about this a lot all my life. I, it just seemed to pour out of him, uh, and I think in this case, of course, he had observed his, his parents at this point. Both his parents had died um, when he wrote King Lear, but they didn't live into immense old age, and this was not a personal problem that he had, but he, he, his mind works that way. He enters into the characters he addresses. Yeah, perhaps we should have, uh, I mean, uh, you're right. Thank you very much, Rita. Maybe we should have one more question and then, and then uh, I should. Of course. Sorry to be so intrusive, but if I could ask you if you're interested in talking to Professor Greenblatt, if you could make your way to the lobby where we'll be he'll be signing books and selling them. He's supposed to have a car meet him at 9.30 and that ain't gonna happen. So you could help him get home by doing that after the, the last question. Thank you. 
Thank you, Rita. I'm, you're right. I mean, I should. I, I lose track of these things, as you will have discovered. Hi, uh, Richard Averbush. I live here in Lexington. Very uh, much appreciated the uh, uh, talk. I was actually speaking earlier with a friend of mine about performance and how, the, the, how critically important it is for people to hear and see and feel the performance of Shakespeare. We didn't really talk about that, but I wonder if you could just comment um, in terms of the performing style for Lear and how much actors and directors' interpretation of this of, relates to some of the points that you made. Yes. There, thank you. There was, a, as you probably know, I mean, uh, there was a period of time, several things to say about performance. Lear had a, seems to have been uh, only modestly successful, it wasn't a failure, but, but uh, uh, by the later part of the 17th century, Lear was performed only in a version in which Cordelia lived and married Edgar. Uh, at the end and lived happily ever after, as far as we could tell in the play. In other words, that people found the, end, the play too disagreeable, too painful. Uh, all, and, and that version of the play in which, in which uh, that, with a happy ending, was the one that held the stage all the way through uh, the, virtually the whole of the 18th century. Uh, and it was only in the 19th century that people began to read carefully the original version, the version that Shakespeare uh, left. And then they said the play was not, perform was not possible to perform it. So that, that people like Charles Lamb, early 19th century uh, critics of Shakespeare said this is a stupendous poem, a poem in the form of a play, but it's not, you couldn't possibly perform it on stage. It's just unbearable, too painful, and you couldn't convey the titanic power of it to show an actor hobbling around on stage would betray what was going on in the, in the play. And it's only in, in in a way, it's tempting to say that it's only in the miserable grimness of the 20th century uh, that people began to think, yes, the play could be performed that this, that the, and performed brilliantly, that the sight of so much suffering uh, could be conveyed in the bodies of actors. And now we have on stage, as I've seen and many of you will have seen, but also in film, uh, there are a whole series of, of quite remarkable uh, film versions of Lear in a variety of different manners and styles that convey, I think, the power. And of course, you're right that, that seeing the play uh, in, in the flesh, as it were, uh, even in the unbearable moments, such as the blinding of Gloucester and other terrible moments, that that has a kind of riveting power that, uh, that the page uh, can't reproduce. I hope you do see the play uh, if you haven't already seen it. Thank you again for your time. Thank you.